الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا. So we are continuing our discussion on the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. ولله الأسماء الحسنى فادعوه بها. Allah ta'ala says in the Quran and to Allah belongs the most beautiful, most perfect of names. So call on to him through these names. Today we begin our discussion with name number 68, As-Samad. And we all know Surah Al-Ikhlas, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakul lahu kufun ahad. And this is a surah that we, we learn when we are children, we probably use it on a daily basis when we pray, uh, but we might not necessarily have stopped to think about what the word samad means. In the book that we're using, it's translated as the eternal. Uh, and that's certainly one of the meanings of the word as samad uh, And remember that this surah, Surah Al-Ikhlas, the reason it's called Surah Al-Ikhlas or called Surah Al-Tawheed is because it is the pillar upon which uh, is based our faith in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said that reciting Surah Al-Ikhlas is, is as the equivalent of reciting one-third of the Qur'an. As-Samad. As-Samad is that the, uh, if we used it in regular language, it's the person or the object to, towards whom we turn and ask and plea. So uh, if I were to turn to somebody and ask them for help, that would be a manifestation of that word, a samad. And of course, to Allah Ta'ala belongs the, the greatest example so Allah being described as a samad means that we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala absolutely uh, and we need are in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he is a samad. He is the one to whom we can turn. He is the one to whom we can uh, take our grievances. He is the one to whom we can ask. Nobody else we can ask except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So because all of the creation belongs to Allah, and because he is able over all things, and we'll talk about that attribute shortly, we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, another interesting meaning of the name or the word samad is in the regular Arabic language, it can also refer to an object that's hollow. And of course, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the greatest example, but the idols that people worshipped and continue to worship, you know, there are different types of idols that people worship. They are hollow. They have no substance to them. Uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is not hollow. Sorry, the word samad means something that is not hollow. And the reason it's one of, its, one of the derivative meanings is that other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is empty of substance. And therefore Allah ta'ala alone is full. Allah ta'ala is complete. Allah ta'ala is able, qadir. So therefore, we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, for, for that, all of our needs. So it is one of those great names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as-samad. Uh, and it also means eternal as it is translated. So uh, the, the samadaniya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he is eternal, without beginning and without end, that nothing can encompass him, etc. But I wanted to dig in a little bit with, into some of those meanings uh, so that we understand why it appears, for example, in Surah Al-Ikhlas, which is such a central surah for us. So that was name 68. Next, today there's going to be a lot of couplets, a lot of the dual names. So 69 and 70, Al-Qadr and Al-Muqtadr, which are translated in the book as the powerful, all powerful, and all determinant. And all of this comes back to Qudra, to Allah Ta'ala's absolute ability. We often find in the Quran, Al-Qadir, inna Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir. In, indeed, Allah is over all things able. Qadir is not the name that appears in the hadith of Imam Tirmidhi upon which is based this book, but it is also one of Allah Ta'ala's names. So Al-Qadir, Al-Muqtadir, Al-Qadir, they are all different forms of the same you know, idea or the same name with a capital N, if you will, about Allah Ta'ala's absolute Ability. In Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir. Allah is able over all things. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There's no ability or no strength except by uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And qudra is one of the uh, most important names or concepts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially 
when we talk about uh, theology, and maybe at the end of our series, uh, I might just make a few remarks uh, about that, but there are seven core names that we are taught uh, when we are young uh, that help us understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's nature, and Qudra is one of them. There is nothing that Allah can't do. There is nothing that He wills and is unable to do or unable to achieve. And if something is not done, it means that Allah Ta'ala wills it not to be done, not that Allah Ta'ala is unable to do it. Our ability is vastly different from that. Our ability is contingent on strength, is contingent on many things, many exterior things and interior things. But theologically, all of these things come back to what Allah Ta'ala has created in us. When we talk about Allah's ability, it means Allah's ability is absolute. So everything that we see around us is a manifestation of Allah Ta'ala's ability, of Allah's will that He has determined and willed that certain things will be and they are. Allah Ta'ala, for example, has not willed that the end of time be now, which is why we are alive. But that does not mean that Allah Ta'ala can't bring it all to an end. So because, just because something isn't, it doesn't mean that it's not in His ability. And I think here, even though it might sound like we're you know, splitting hairs, I think here a lot of people, uh, they have a little bit of a, a deficiency in their belief because a lot of people, whether they be Muslim or non-Muslim, they think maybe subconsciously that there are things that God can't do. They think that Allah Ta'ala is not able to do certain things. And that's why Qudra is, is fundamental. It is always with Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. It is an, it is an essential part of Allah Ta'ala's uh, nature. But if there's something that we want done and it doesn't happen, it's not that Allah is not able to cause it to happen. It is that Allah has not willed for it to happen. But at the end of the day, inna Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir. Indeed, Allah Ta'ala is able uh, over all things. Qudra and, and this idea of absolute ability of Allah Ta'ala, I'm not going to say that we're the only people that talk about it. Because it's hard to have a belief system in, in the divine without thinking that the divine is able. But certainly we are unique in our emphasis on this idea of Qudra. We believe that it is an essential part of all the Prophet's message from the beginning of Adam salam to the time of Sayyidina Muhammad وسلم, which is why belief in all of the Prophets is an essential part of our belief. We believe in all of the Anbiya those whose names we know and those whose names we don't know. It's always important to remember that. And the essential uh, you know, belief or message of the prophets is in belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, you can't believe in God if you do not believe in God's absolute ability. So this is something that will be shared throughout uh, you know, other religions and we'll find you know, hints of it even though if it may be covered over or maybe not given its due weight, but for us, we are very emphatic in de declaring Allah Ta'ala's absolute ability. And it's not, an, it's, not an, it's not an accident that the two names, you know, 69 and 70 are Al-Qadr and Al-Muqtadr, the all-powerful, the all-determinant. And then Qadir is also another one of Allah's divine names, even though it doesn't appear in the specific hadith that we're kind of unpacking uh, together, the hadith of Tirmidhi narrated by Abu Huraira, upon which the book of Ghazali is uh, uh, formed, as well as most of the other commentaries on the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we say that Allah ta'ala is qadr, Allah ta'ala is able over all things, therefore, that is why we ultimately make sujood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we acknowledge that. We acknowledge that Allah's ability is, is absolute and everything that we see as a manifest is determined by Him. Muqtadr is determined by his, his power and His will. And therefore, we acknowledge that and we make sujood uh, uh, to Him. So this is also very uh, important vis-a-vis -vis our theological belief. So it it's a, has a spiritual meaning that we are reminded you know, in tough times and difficult times that Allah is able over all things. We also talk about it frequently in our theological sciences to form our structure of what it is that we believe in, which is a little bit you know, tangential to the current uh, topic. 
Name 71 and 72, again another pair. Al Muqaddim wal Muakhir. The promoter and the postponer. Al Muqaddim, to promote or to advance, and Al Muakhir, to postpone or to delay. And the reason, uh, if you'll remember many, many lectures ago, we talked about the importance of the dual names, that one of the functions of the dual names is that we mention them together. We don't mention one without the other. In this case, it's very clear that we can't mention one without the other because to promote something is to delay or postpone something else. To postpone something is to advance or promote something else. So one necessitates the other. Al-Muqaddim wal muakhir And what's interesting is that only Allah Ta'ala can be described like this. We cannot contain both within us. We cannot advance and delay something at the same time. Only Allah Ta'ala can do that. So mentioning the names together, even though they're separate, I mean, they're two names, so they count as, as two in, in the uh, enumerating of them. But Allah Ta'ala alone, subhanahu, can be described as having uh, both. So, and there's a pattern in Allah's creation. In Islam, we talk about the Salaf, the people of the past, and the Khalaf, us, the people that came after them. Uh, we talk about, for example, Allah Ta'ala uh, advancing certain times. Like on Friday, there's a special time in which the uh, uh, dua is accepted. Friday itself is a special day out of the week. Allah has advanced Friday and then postponed or delayed the importance of some of the other days. Not that the other days are not important, but the advancing of one means that it stands above the other. So one is advanced and one is behind. Allah Ta'ala has advanced the month of Ramadan and delayed the other months. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala has advanced the three holy mosques, the mosques of uh, Jerusalem, Mecca, and uh, Medina, over the other masajid. And Allah has also advanced or promoted the masjid as a concept versus other spaces that have been mu'akhar, that have been postponed a little bit. There is extra reward in going to the mosque as extra reward for making dua in these special times. So when you think about al-muqaddim and al-mu'akhir, almost everything that we have in our deen life, our spiritual life, is a manifestation uh, of this. And again, as I said, uh, you, you know, one necessitates the other. And that's why we mention them uh, together. The next pair, the next set that we'll talk about, which is also pair named 73 and 74, al wal akhir, the first and the last. In, uh, in Christian theology, they call it the Alpha and the Omega, you know, the, be the first and the last, the, the beginning and the end. Meaning the beginning without beginning and the end without end. And Allah Ta'ala is eternal. And again, only Allah Ta'ala can be uh, can be described as such. Uh, we cannot be the first and the last at the same time. So this is, you know, one of the beautiful pairings of Allah's uh, beautiful attributes. And also it is related to other religions, uh, particularly the monotheistic religions or the Abrahamic religions in which this is a point of uh, very strong uh, comparison, you know, that we have when we talk for people that are engaged in that kind of like dialogue on a theological level, that Allah is the beginning and the end. Can Allah wa la ma? Allah was and nothing was with Him. Everything will perish except the countenance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these verses, or the hadith and the verse, talk about Allah's being the first and the last, al awwal wa al akhir. Al-awwal wal akhir wa al wal batin, which are the next two names. So th that's the verse that comes together. So these couplets. So verse, uh, so name 75 and 76, al-zahir wal batin, uh, the manifest and the hidden. Allah is manifest and hidden. When we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is manifest, Allah is so manifest that he does not need a proof for his existence. For existence itself belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which is a very important concept because many of us probably that grew up in the West think 
the opposite, that somebody has to prove the existence of God. But the Muslim pers perspective is, no, you have to prove that God does not exist because his existence requires no proof. Because the fact that everything is, and all of these names that we've been talking, now we're on 75 and 76, you know, the majority of them, and then we have uh, about 20 left, 20 or so left, all of them, when we, when we get into them, they demonstrate for us the absolute power and ability and magnificence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, one of the famous lines of poetry that we use in this regard is that indeed in everything there is a sign that proves that he is one. So for the believer, everything around us proves that Allah Ta'ala is in existence. The fact that everything has a life cycle, that has a beginning and an end, that comes to pass, that uh, certain uh, matter has certain qualities and certain accidents can befall those qualities, tell us that there is a creator outside of that system that has created us. So when you get into the study of logic in Islam and when you get to the study of theology in Islam, you realize that that when we approach these matters, the the zahirness, the apparentness and manifestness of Allah Ta'ala is so great, we are the ones that are sometimes distant from Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. The veil is from us, Not nothing can veil Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. Nothing can encompass, you can't put Allah and, and cover Him or put Him in a box. So when we are distant in our understanding of these things, those veils come from us. And those veils are part of our, uh, you know, almost like a delusional way of thinking that we are not clear in, in, in being able to see uh, the, 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 the manifest. Allah Ta'ala is also al batin He is also the hidden. And inside of us, we have the knowledge of Allah. Inside our hearts, we have faith. We have the, the light of faith, nur al-iman. So Allah doesn't you know, dwell in us, of course, but Allah Ta'ala is in us from the point of view is that in our soul and in our hearts is the knowledge and understanding of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. So He's also al batin So He's manifest and He is, uh, he is hidden. Uh, one of the interesting stories, and I, I might have mentioned this before, uh, that's narrated that Imam al-Razi, uh, rahimahullah, was you know, this great uh, theologian, uh, and uh, from, uh, he was in Naysapur, and uh, the city you know, was, was having a celebration because he wrote this book in which he argued a thousand uh, proofs for the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's this old lady and she, you know, she's seeing this festive site. So she asks one of these, you know, one of his students, who, he's one of his, the Sheikh students, what, what's all of this commotion? What's going on? She's like, oh, this is Imam al-Razi. We're celebrating this new book that he wrote. Uh, he has a thousand proofs for the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the old lady said, is it because he has a thousand doubts? You know, how could there be any doubt in Allah ta'ala's existence? So when the student told the Sheikh the story, uh, Imam al-Razi said, you know, Allah give me the faith of the old lady of Naysapur. Because the academic scholarly pursuit of responding you know, to people's doubts and you know, bringing all of our proofs is one thing, but our personal belief and our personal life as Muslims is something else. And what he was saying is that that's true faith, faith that is unwavering. Because Allah Ta'ala is a dhahi. All of this is from Allah Ta'ala's creation. Uh, and as great as creation is size-wise and as amazing as, as life is in all of its diversity, there are also all these patterns and limitation that reminds us that behind that there is a sauna, behind uh, that is, a, is the author, is the creator of all of that. So Allah Ta'ala is a zahir and as I said, Allah Ta'ala is also the batin because he, his, the knowledge of him resides in us uh, always. Uh, um, before uh, we turn to questions, uh, there was one question uh, from last week that I wanted to address the difference between uh, Al Ahad and Al Wahid. Of course, Al Ahad uh, comes, first of all, m many of the ulama say that they're very similar and they're, they mean the same thing. Uh, so I could have just gotten off the hook and just said that. But you know, there are some slight differences that I think we can benefit from. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ 
you know. So the Ahad comes also in Surah Al-Ikhlas. And there's also a, 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 a Wahid, which is uh, many verses in the Quran in which Allah Ta'ala is referred to as Al-Wahid. As far as Al-Ahad is concerned, Al-Ahad is that Allah Ta'ala is unique in all of these attributes that we are talking about. That nobody else can share those attributes with Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. He is Al-Ahad. And ahad is, a, is a, a, a word that you cannot use for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-wahid, in normal language, you usually say wahid, ithneen, thalatha, you say one, two, three. But when we refer to Allah ta'ala as al-wahid, it means he is al-wahid without having a second. That he is one without having a sharik, without having an associate. He is absolutely one. So that's why the names sometimes are used interchangeably because the wahid description of Allah Ta'ala also means that he's ahad, that he is unique. Wahid al-fard, he is alone without an associate. Of course, when you say that, you know, this is one uh, in normal language, it can, it, it can also mean that, well, maybe there's a second or a third. It's possible. But with Allah Ta'ala, of course, that's an impossibility. So those are some of the meanings of Wahid and Ahad. I mean, they are, to be fair, very similar, uh, but uh, th 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 those are the differences. Al Ahad being Allah Ta'ala uniquely described with all of these attributes. Al Wahid meaning in reference to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala without having an associate. Shukran. Sunday in Arabic is Al Ahad, yes. That is true. As a day of the week, Al Ahad, Al Ithnain, Thulatha, etc. But we're not describing a person by that, it's just the name of the day. Uh, okay. So, are there any uh, questions? I believe we will have four more classes uh, because many of the names coming up are couple, couplets. So I believe inshallah, uh, I'm anticipating four more uh, classes until we finish, which means that I would also like uh, people to think about what we would like to do next. I'll also uh, be giving that some thought as well, inshallah. A samad is only mentioned once in the Quran. Is that right? I believe so. Let's check really quickly. I'm not sure. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I think it's only once. Yeah. In Surah Al-Ikhlas. Is there a special dhikr routine related to a samad? Not, not, that, I, uh, not that I know of. Um, but Surah Al-Ikhlas is very frequent in our uh, spiritual literature. Uh, different special events throughout the year, reciting Surah Al-Ikhlas a thousand times, reciting Surah Al-Ikhlas 300 times. Um, some of the Sahaba, or one of the Sahaba, uh, he loved Surah Al-Ikhlas so much that that's what he used in his prayer. And, you know, some of the Sahaba thought that was odd. So they asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu praised that. And, you know, he said that the Ikhlas is worth a third of the Qur'an. Uh, so Ikhlas is, Ikhlas by itself is a uh, dhikr, as well as Ikhlas Falaq nas of course, as a dhikr before we sleep, um, to recite each three times. So, that would be, you know, a summit would be a part of that. Uh, in our ad, uh, Fat here, you know, it says, La ilaha illa, ilahan wahidan, ahdan, samadan, 
fadan vitran hayan koyuman daiman abada is one of the zikr okay so the, the, the that's uh, from the salat the, the prayers of the the people of kashmir is sheikh ali hamdani rahmatullahi alayhi I have given you the. I have given you the book. Yes, I have it. I have it over on my shelf. We will. We will. Inshallah, recite it someday. Inshallah. 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 Yeah. Doesn't Allah's quality as Batin mean that He, Subhanahu wa Taala, is aware of our inner thoughts, imaginations, aspirations? Uh, that's Allah's ilm. Allah's ilm, His knowledge, Allahu Alim, uh, meaning that He knows all of the generals and the particulars. So. Uh, uh, not that Allah Ta'ala is al-batin, that he knows our inner thoughts, it's that Allah's ilm is what lets him know our inner thoughts. But I mean, it's, you know, same idea, but, but if that would belong to Allah's knowledge. So when we say that Allah is alim, <clears throat> that means he, is absolute, he has absolute knowledge of everything. A tree doesn't fall, uh, a, a, a leaf doesn't fall from a tree, a creature doesn't stir, uh, on, on land or on sea, except that Allah Ta'ala knows about it. Uh, that's a very powerful concept of Allah Ta'ala's knowledge, and you can't hide from Allah. A very beautiful verse that nothing happens on land or in sea or nothing moves or stirs except that it is in a book written by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sheikh Hisham Qabbani has written a full book on Surah Al-Ikhlas. I recommend this as it has many dimensions. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I don't, uh, I have many of his books, but not all of them. So I don't know the name of the book, but, uh, you know, of course I would recommend that. Could I say more about reciting Surah Al-Ikhlas being equal to a third of the Qur'an? Why is it a third of the Qur'an? Because of the meaning of Tawheed that is embedded in the, uh, in the Surah. So Tawheed basically therefore then is one third of our religion. In other words, that's how important that concept is, that Allah is one without partners, he's not begotten, he has no children, he has no parts, he has no end, he is eternal, he is a samad, we can rely on him. All of those meanings in Surah Al-Ikhlas, that's like what the Prophet alayhi is saying, that's one third of everything that's going to occupy your religious life. That's the weight of it. And the reason we call it Ikhlas is the, the chapter of purity is because it is the pure faith that we are after. To have that pure faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Faith in His oneness, relying on Him and Him alone, not associating with Him. And when we say don't associate with Allah ta'ala, you know, no one, no, nobody's going to get an idol and put them by their bedstand and you know, pray to We know that. But, but we associate other forces with Allah ta'ala all the time. Uh, and we fear things, uh, thinking at that moment of fear that Allah Ta'ala is not in control. This is natural human. So the reason we have this surah and we recite it all the time, almost as much as we recite the Fatiha, is to inculcate this meaning that Allah Ta'ala is behind all of this. So inshallah, we pray that Allah gives us this faith, this sincere faith, inshallah, uh, and trust uh, in Him. Anybody else have any questions? Is there a difference between the trust in Allah and fatalism? Um, well, there's a couple of things to keep in mind. One is that if we look at fatalism, the idea that everything is, well, f f fatalism, 
predeterminism, you know, the idea that everything has been preordained. Of course, we believe in that, but the word fatalism in English, it has like a negative connotation, almost like an apathetic con connotation that we don't have to do anything. And remember when we talked about Qadr a few lectures ago, we talked about Qadr with a capital Q. I mean, that's my language. Qadr with a capital Q and with a lowercase Q. There are certain things that have been preordained that are not going to change. Uh, you can't change who your parents are. You can't change your gender. You can't change where you were born. Uh, from the point of view of our belief in Qadr, I mean, you can change the outward form of your gender. You know, people, people do. But, but for us, gender and... Um, uh, sexual identity are not, there's no bifurcation between them. So th that's what I mean. And I, I don't want to get into that, that debate right now. But so those are things that you can't, you can't change when you're going to die or where you're going to die. These things have sort of been, been, been written. But there are other types of qadr. Well, I guess it, actually in the case of, of death, that's a little bit different. In other words, there are things in the past that you can't change. But there are things yet to come that can change. There can be Ibram, there can be a change in the Qadr based on your actions. So for example, Allah has written on you. If I ask, if you make dua for such and such, Allah Ta'ala will let this happen. Or if you don't make dua for such and such, then he'll let that happen. So not everything is fatalistic from the point of view that absolutely everything is preordained and you have no say in everything because we also believe that we have free will. However, What's important to remember is that everything is within the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even in that scenario, if I make this dua, this will happen, or if I don't, this will happen. Allah will know what it is that we will choose or how we will act because nothing escapes the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah does not make us do that or make us not do that. That's sort of the fatalistic approach that Allah makes us do something almost so there's no point. No, there is point because we are free. And the proof is that we believe that we will be taken to account. We will be judged for our, for our actions. So there's a hadith, for example, that keeping family ties increases in your life. So some of the ulama understand that, that literally the, the more you keep family ties, Allah will extend in your life. So if, meaning that if you don't, then maybe your life will be shortened in years and days and hours, etc. cetera. Um, so that's the fatalistic predetermination thing. As far as trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the benefits of learning uh, Allah ta'ala's beautiful names is that we want to have a, a, a more fruitful and healthy and positive relationship with Allah ta'ala. We want to remember that Allah is merciful and Allah is forgiving and Allah is loving and therefore we, we trust in the things that Allah ta'ala has created for us, our life and what is befalling us. We we rely on him, we turn to him, uh, etc. And we ask. The Prophet Sallallahu said, uh, Allahu uh, Man la yas'alullah, Allahu yaghdab alayh, aw kama qal Sallallahu Something along the lines that whoever does not ask Allah, Allah becomes angry with them. So it is a sunnah for us to act, ask. You know, Allah Ta'ala knows that we are in need and we have to ask. So there's nothing wrong with that. So... Uh, I don't see necessarily a contradiction between them. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Surah Ikhlas. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Kulf wa Allahu ahad. Allahu samad. Lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakun lahu kufan ahad. It all says about monotism. It is nothing but monotism. And as we study Quran, the central just meaning is the same monotheism, monotheism. Yes, that means I mean Tawheed. So, is it the this surah is it the the central Tawheed of Quran? Yes, this is the central. You know, if if we were to ask a basic question, what does Islam say about God? Our answer would be Surah Al-Ikhlas. You know, everything we need to know about Allah Taala is in Surah Al-Ikhlas. So can it be called Surah Tawheed? Yes, it can be called Surah Tawheed. The surahs have different names. So it can be called Surah Tawheed. Thank you. Thank you. When is the best time to recite the 99 names of Allah? 
this, it's open-ended. There's no, it's not like the prayer and Ramadan where those are fixed. Uh, mentioning Allah's name, dhikr is open. Ya ayuha ladhina amanu, ithkuru allaha dhikran kathira, wa sabihuhu bukratan wa asila. All the time, night and day. There's no precondition to, to, to remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's no uh, good time, bad time. Any time is the answer. Any time you feel like it, you can call on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shukran. Shukran Afwan. How does Islam's notion of monotheism compare to Judaism's? I mean, Judaism is, is obviously monotheistic without doubt, but there are many anthropomorphic concepts. We would say there are many anthropomorphic concepts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as described in Jewish texts. Uh, you know, the God of Israel is a jealous God. You know, we have, would have a problem with that. What, what does that mean For, from all of what we've been talking about that's very problematic that we would say something. You know, jealousy is a negative trait and we can't ascribe any form of negativity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, there is a, I remember a rabbinic text that I studied. Uh, it's called the story of the oven of Akhnai. And there's this guy named Akhnai and, and there's like some dispute about his oven. And uh, the rabbis come over and they start debating uh, about what's right to do in the city. I think the, the oven broke or something or burned down. So in the text, God speaks to the rabbis <laughs> and gives them the answer. And then the rabbis talk back to God and they say, no, 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 you don't know, we know. And then God laughs and he says something like, my children have overtaken me. Or, you know, that's like the gist of the text. I mean, that's a highly problematic text uh, for us because uh, it, it is anthropomorphic because it makes God just like an uber person, just like a super person. He's like us, but just bigger and stronger and wiser. We say, nothing is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no such thing as us overtaking God or, or having more ability or power. So one of the critiques would be that there is anthropomorphic or allows for anthropomorphism. Orthodox Jews, men, for example, who grow their sideburns, you know, and, and they curl uh, and they're long. One of the reasons why is they say that this is how God looks like, or it's like to emulate the image of God. I mean, that's completely anthropomorphic. When we say, when we read in the Quran that Allah has a hand or Allah manifests on the throne, al arsh is stawa, these things. You know, Allah can see, we, you know, the ulama are obsessed with making sure we understand this does not mean in the way we look or we see or we, you know, don't think that Allah's hand is like our hand, but just bigger. No, no, So that would be one of the big, you know, the big problems. The other or, or big critiques, the other critique <clears throat> is this idea that, again, to be fair, maybe not all uh, Jewish interpretations are like this, but the idea that, the, that God belongs somehow to the Jewish people because they are the chosen people and sort of everyone else is not chosen and almost like God does not belong to the other people. You know, Allah is Allah. He's the creator of everything. So it's, it, it's a, a limited, what I said to me, it's anthropomorphic. From our perspective, we would say that it's anthropomorphic. One of the um, critiques of Ibn Taymiyyah, and this is just one, I mean, it needs to be verified, is that Ibn Taymiyyah was influenced by a Jewish philosopher who later became Muslim, whose name escapes me, uh, and that his uh, Jewish anthropomorphic in, uh, tendencies are what influenced Ibn Taymiyyah's anthropomorphic tendencies. So the anthropomorphic thing is probably the biggest distinction. But other than that, you know, it's Tawheed, the way we understand God is one, you know, clear text against idol worship, against taking false gods, you know, uh, things like that. Alhamdulillah. That was helpful.
<clears throat> any uh, any other questions or issues? Anthropomorphic means to give human traits, qualities, and descriptions to God. So, if I, um, which is basically what happened to ancient Greek and ancient Roman religion. Ancient Greek and Roman religion is completely anthropomorphic. The gods on Olympus, they're like us, but just stronger. Uh, you know, they're, they're mischievous. You know, they do all these bad things. They sleep around, they kill people, they get jealous, they fight with one another. <laughs> it's completely anthropomorphic, meaning that they're all described in human form. And even the art that is influenced by the ancient, you know, ancient European civilization, the ancient, specifically the ancient Greek and the ancient Roman, you know, all of those statues and those sculptures are just basically human form. So it's, it, it, that's the most extreme. We, we have uh, the exact opposite. We are purely monotheistic. We have no anthropomorphic tendencies whatsoever when it comes to Allah. Nothing is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we talk about God, uh, uh, one of the uh, motivations I had for doing the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is exactly this, is to teach us and remind us not to slip into any anthropomorphic concepts. So if I said, for example, you know, God can't do this, that's to limit God, can't do something, we can't do things. You know, I can't lift the truck, right? I I'm unable to. There's no such thing as inability for Allah Ta'ala. That is a human concept. So that would be an anthropomorphic concept, for example. So that's what it means. Is Hinduism anthropomorphic? Um, it, it, yes, and polytheistic, of course. I mean, I think that there's a different, you know, Hinduism, the, the challenge with Hinduism, uh, you know, many scholars have difficulty in defining what Hinduism is because Hinduism is so ancient. It's almost like every religious trend in the Indian subcontinent be became subsumed in Hinduism. So you have to, for the Muslim, when they see a Hindu, they, they freak out, you know, the, the Ganesh and, you know, all of these things. They're like, oh, a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim. But if you think about it, and if you, because I studied it, I, I'm not from the subcontinent. So I had the advantage of not having that bias. So when I studied it, uh, at its heart, it's very, I think, very monotheistic. Um, and it is shirk, the way that we are warned not to associate other things and other forces with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the concept of Brahma and, you know, is very tawhidic in the core of the Hindu teaching. Uh, but that's my, my personal experience. And, you know, I know not many people share that. But it would be more, it's polytheistic and anthropomorphic, of course. Okay, so uh, my, my, I have an ask for the community which is uh, over the next two, three weeks, uh, either during the class or personally, you can you know, message me or, or email me or whatever. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for ideas of what to do next. Uh, Sunday, inshallah, is the beginning of Rabi al Awal, uh, which we know is the month of the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu And inshallah, we have a program uh, that's coming uh, for that. Uh, in which we'll all participate, inshallah, and it will be awesome, uh, like it is every year, inshallah. But also, Rabi al awwal means that we are six months away from Ramadan. <laughs> so, uh, the way I like to think about it, Rabi al awwal is significant for those two reasons. So, the way I like to think about it is, okay, we have like, let's say, five, six months after we finish this, or let's say five months after we finish this, until we, you know, we're going to go back into our Ramadan program. So do we want to do something that takes up those five months, you know, 20, you know, 16 to 20 weeks? This today is lecture 15. So we have a few more. 
So do we want something that's going to be like this or do we want to do something short? Uh, so I like to always hear the f feedback. Of course, I have my own ideas uh, and I'll add those to my list as well. Uh, but I would like to also hear from the community. Um, not now, it doesn't have to be right now, but I would like to hear from people what sort of things they, they would like. I don't want to you know, be boring and I don't want people, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're sick of seeing me every Friday on the computer screen. Um, so the, the, what, I, what I can do is I can try to change the subject matter. Okay, Brother Mawson is saying maybe next Friday I can do something related to the CETA that I have not covered. Uh, I, yeah, I can certainly do that. In, in other words, uh, put the 99 names on hold and then do CETA or something related to the Prophet rather, alayhi salatu salam. Uh, that's that's possible. That's possible. So give it a think, and we will. Uh, uh, you know, I'll take everything under uh, advisement, inshallah. Keeping in mind that we are doing this once a month thing with the open questions. The, uh, um, <clears throat> okay, so maybe next Friday we, we can do that. We can take a break from the 99 names and we can do something related to the Prophet. I mean, we can even do that for the next couple of weeks. That's fine. Uh, but other topics that people are interested in, uh, let me know. Uh, I like to just know how people are thinking. I don't want you just to, you know, I'm, I'm always more academic. So sometimes I, I teach the text and, and I don't want people to be bored. So let me know, inshallah. Uh, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless all of you and our families and our parents and our children and to protect us. Unfortunately, the numbers of, of cases are rising. So we ask Allah Ta'ala to keep us safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, you know, only a few weeks left until the election. So please, uh, everyone that is able to, to, to vote, uh, to, uh, you know, um, meet your civic obligation as a citizen and as a law-abiding member of the society. Uh, that's something that's very important, inshallah. And also pray for the nation. <clears throat> Uh, we ask Allah Ta'ala to protect our republic and our nation uh, and uh, to protect our children from all harm in this world and the next, to have mercy on our parents, to have mercy and forgiveness for those who have passed before us. We ask Allah Ta'ala to lift all our brothers and sisters who are struggling everywhere in the world because of their Islam. We ask Allah Ta'ala to uh, take them out of their repression and their depression and their persecution and may they they have the safety and the luxury of life and happiness that we so so much take for granted, insha'Allah. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Allahumma salli afdala salatin ala as'adi makhluqatika sayyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim adada ma'lumatika wa midada kalimatika kullama dhakaraka dhakiruna wa ghafala an dhikrihi al-ghafilun